welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Here at Wembley Stadium, many an English ambition has been realised and many a Scottish hope has been dashed. And tomorrow, the latest chapter in the oldest international match in football will be played out and the oldest rivalry joined once again. On every rational assessment, England's rich reservoir of talent should send them victorious. England were World Cup semi-finalists in 2018 and according to their talisman captain Harry Kane, they are even stronger now. They have started confidently seeing off Croatia. Scotland, in contrast, sneaked into the finals of the Euro tournament by virtue of two penalty shootouts. Their high hopes of a first game victory were dashed by the Czechs at Hampden Park on Monday. And yet, somewhere almost unspoken in the football undergrowth, there is a whisper that the underdogs may just be the rising side on the cusp of a golden generation of young Scottish talent. Could they finally blossom this week, led by their captain and inspirational left-back, Andy Robertson? Today on the Alex Salmon Show, we delve into some of the hidden history of the world's most ancient football rivalry and speculate on what it might just mean for the politics of the two nations. It is 22 years since Scotland beat the old enemy of football and even then, it was the second leg of a playoff and it was England who still qualified. But way back in the history of the game, it was this Scotland team who were dominant. In 1882, the home of English football was not here at Wembley, but at the Oval, now one of the homes of English cricket. Scotland were captained by another cultured left-back, a football pioneer, a groundbreaker, and the world's first black international player. Alex takes up the remarkable story with football historian Lou Walker, with some help from England legend John Barnes and Ifeoma Diaki, the first and thus far only black woman to captain Scotland. Well, Lou Walker, right at the Oval, one of the homes of English cricket, but in March 1881, there was a football match played here, an international match. Tell me what happened. Yeah, well, England got a thumping, I'm afraid. Um, but the Scottish team was led by uh, Andrew Watson. So who was this guy, Scotland's left back and captain, Andrew Watson? Andrew Watson was the first um, man of colour to play international football. So, I mean, I'm grown up immersed in Scottish football. Uh, I know about the Wembley Wizards, I know about the 1967 game in uh, Scotland against England. Uh, why have I never heard of a Scottish captain who led his side to a 6-1 thrashing of England? Uh, it's partly because the, you know, the, the speed at the, uh, which the game developed and partly because it was considered an entertainment and, and no one really kept good records or kept histories or did any kind of, of research or analysis on football. And, and these, this generation, Andrew Watson's generation and the generation that followed him, they're the forgotten generation of, of football. But they're the ones that, that founded the game as we know it today. And you've written a book about uh, Andrew Watson. Tell us, tell us a bit about the title first. Explain the title to me. Yeah, Andrew Watson, A Straggling Life. It, it, it's a phrase that was used by a journalist to describe uh, Andrew when he left for Bootle to play football, a Scottish journalist. Um, and it was the inspiration behind me wanting to research him further because none of, there was no, there was no uh, uh, information about his human, the, the human side of his, of his life, of his family or, or anything. And I started to look. And yeah, he did lead a straggling life. He did. And how influential was what happened here in March 1881 and Andrew Watson's career in England to the development of the game internationally? Oh, well, Watson, um, in this game, 6-1, and then the, the following year, the 5-1, um, Watson was part of a Scottish team that forced the English FA to, to change the way they played, to consider the future. He came down, he played with Corinthians, he taught, he brought the Scottish game to the Corinthians and those Corinthians he played alongside would end up playing for the national team. And then of course, you know, the Corinthians became one of the, probably the greatest amateur team of all time. They, the Corinthians took the game around the world. They took it to America, they took it to South Africa, they took it to Brazil, um, introduced football to Brazil. The Corinthians, Corinthian Paulista is, is a remnant of, of, of those visits. Um, yeah, Watson was part of a team that changed the way football was played globally. Ifeoma Daiki, amazing Scotland career, 123 caps over a 13-year period. 
Uh, you captain Scotland just over 130 years after Andrew Watson became the first black international footballer uh, and led his Scotland side way back in 1881 to uh, uh, a memorable 6-1 uh, triumph over England at the, the, at the Oval. What do you think about that story of Andrew Watson and uh, the efforts that are now being made to, to bring that figure back to the, the, the centrality of Scottish football? Like for me, like I actually had no idea about it. Growing up in Scotland from when I was three years old, playing for the Scotland team for 13 years, being in and out of Hampton and things like that. And I can't even say that I even knew the story. It's like one that came before you and known their story. I think it's important to carry that over. And that went over my head and that was only brought to my attention. And I think that's incredible. The fact that it happened 130 years ago, but we're only finally talking about it now. It's obviously been in the, in the dark for way too long. So I'm glad now that, you know, like more attention is being paid to it because it was a huge achievement and we want to obviously continue that going and continue the talk and actually, you know, recognising that historic achievement. Now, exactly 100 years after Andrew Watson became the world's first ever black professional footballer signing for the Merseyside team of Bootle, a young man called John Barnes signed for Liverpool Football Club. John, welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Andrew Watson, had you ever heard about this, uh, this figure, this extraordinary story of a, a black captain of Scotland, led his team to a 6-1 thrashing of England, but was lost from the, the annals of football history? Why do you think that is? I Obviously, once I knew I was coming on the show, I did some research on him. I did know about Scotland's 6-1 uh, thrashing of England, as all Englishmen do. Uh, but to know that there was a, a, a black man playing for Scotland at the time, of course not. Why it was lost in the annals of history was because, of course, a lot of people, you can go back to, to someone, for example, like Tony Collins, who was the first manager, black manager for Rochdale, um, who won the League Cup that no one knows about. We assume that black footballers started with Viv Anderson and black managers started with in the 80s or 90s, whenever the first black manager came along. So, of course, we don't know much about the, the historical aspect of, of so many black figures in history. And that is why it's very interesting to really delve into it. Andrew Watson, in the 1880s, was secretary of Queen's Park, then the greatest yeah. club in the world. He was the first black football administrator. So what does that tell us about the, the lack of progress in 150 years? It speaks volumes, as does Tony Collins, the first black manager in England who managed Rochdale, not a big club, for six years and won the League Cup. But he wasn't particularly successful at Rochdale, however, apart from the League Cup. However, he stayed in the job for seven years. So that tells you that although you're black, and you are not necessarily being successful, but they, they judge you based on your ability. Because, in, in paradoxically, the le when there weren't that many black people, racism was less. The more black people that you have in any country, there is more racism because there's only a certain amount of elite people. And if you have more people who want a slice of the pie to get into these positions, that it then becomes a threat to the status quo. So while you have one or two black people, the racism doesn't have to be great because they're, 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 they don't pose a threat to the status quo because there's one or two of them. When there are hundreds of them, they pose a threat. So therefore, a narrative has to be then been spoken about, about the, the group's potential, the group's worth. There was no discussion about Andrew Watson's potential because it's there to be seen, or Tony Collins' perception because that doesn't pose a threat to the existing status quo that we don't want to upset. Paradoxically, there's much more racism in countries where there, there are more black people rather than less. One man familiar with the extraordinary story of Andrew Watson and who himself experienced blatant and overt racist abuse from so-called football fans in the late 1980s is former England and Rangers wingman Mark Walters. How does he feel all these years later about the controversy around the England team taking the knee? Mark Walters of Rangers Football Club and England. Now, Mark, when you came as one of the, the first prominent uh, black players to, to star in modern Scottish football, you encountered the most overt, disgraceful racism on field. I'm interested how it makes you feel 30 years later that there's controversy about the England team taking the knee, getting booed by some of their own fans. What do you, what's your reaction to, to that situation all these years later? It is very disappointing to think that there is a, a still a lot of problems with, virtually, as you said, overt racism. Don't get me wrong, I, I do believe that the knee has come, or become slightly symbolic. And um, although it's not a bad thing, because people are seeing that some people are trying to do something, 
you know, I'm a big Elfie supporter, if you like, and I, you know, that song, a little, a little, a little more action, less talking, a little more, more conversation, less talking, as it were. I prefer that one really, as in, yes, we've spoke about it a lot now. Now we need to do some things about it, as it were. So it's fantastic that um, not only uh, your teammates but your opponents are being empathetic with the, your situation and so forth. I think now it's time to maybe do a bit more action, if you like, and uh, do things that and make sure it doesn't keep happening as, as it has done for many years. Mark Walters, recently you, you did a documentary on this, the story of Andrew Watson, this remarkable story of the, the first black international footballer, captain of Scotland, led his team to the Oval, thumped England 6-1, uh, and yet, until your documentary, other programmes recently, nobody had ever heard of him. How can that possibly be? Yeah, I totally agree. I'm not necessarily a historian or a statistician of football, but I thought I knew a little bit about it. I know Walter told... Uh, I think he actually signed for Rangers, but he unfortunately he died during the First World War, so he didn't actually play. And then you had players like Clyde Best, who played in the 60s. Uh, he, obviously, Till Regis, uh, Laurie Cunningham, Brendan Bassett in the 70s. Uh, but when I was told um, that a player played not only uh, 100 years ago, but he, he wasn't just an ordinary player. He was absolutely world-class by definition. He played in the best league at the time. He um, was captain of Scotland, uh, which in itself is remarkable because we all know the captains don't necessarily be the best player, but captains are obviously an integral part of the team and probably the, normally the first player that the manager picks. So he's an important player. So, so to think that I'd never heard of this man who played over 100 years before me uh, in Scotland was absolutely unbelievable, yeah. Hey, well, so as far as we can tell from the records, there seemed to have been very little, some, but comparatively little, overt racist prejudice against Andrew Watson in the 1880s. How could we have a situation where that was the 1880s, but in the 1980s, you yeah. were subjected to the most disgraceful, overt, uh, pronounced racist behaviour from so-called football fans? I think maybe it was a bit more cosmopolitan um, in his day in Glasgow. I, I believe that not only was he uh, a great player, but he wasn't the only black player in that squad. And there were some players who'd played before him uh, and obviously some after him as well. So maybe that was a reason why he wasn't as, as you know, pronounced racism as it was when I played up there, yeah. I've got a theory, Mark, that if we'd given this man his proper due in Scotland, if there'd been a, a giant statue erected to, to Andrew Watson outside, uh, outside Hamden Park, you know, recognising that he played for Scotland three times, yeah. the results yeah. were 6-1, 5-1 against England and 5-1 against Wales, if there had been that sort of massive recognition, do you think that would have influenced... Uh, the fans uh, and made them better human beings to understand that Scotland had the first black international captain? Oh, without a doubt. And, and if they didn't know his life story, the fact that he's come from British Guyana, the fact that he was his mother was a freed slave and his father, uh, a, for want of a better word, a slave owner, and that he came to Scotland and done all the things he did, I think definitely they would have a more respect for not only his story, but a lot of players who played after him. So he was a phenomenal uh, human being and um, definitely someone I, I admire now, yeah. Join us after the break when Alex continues his discussion with former England and Rangers wingman Mark Walters. We'll see you then. Welcome back to England's Field of Dreams at Wembley Stadium. But could it be the underdog Scotland who turn into the modern Wembley Wizards? A reference to another unfancied Scottish side who dazzled the Wembley turf in 1928. Alex is in conversation with England winger Mark Walters. Mark Walters, you've got a unique perspective on a, a, a England-Scotland clash because you're an England player, but you starred for Glasgow Rangers uh, in the 1980s and early 90s, Scotland's dominant football club. Well, what perspective do you have on tomorrow's game? Do you think England are going to steamroll over Scotland or will that Scottish team have a few surprises? I think because of the type of game it is, it's, it's, there's, nothing, there's no foregone conclusion to say England are going to walk over Scotland. I mean, I was a bit surprised at the way Scotland 
started their game against Czechoslovakia, I believe. They were very gong ho, very cavalier, and the game was very open. And unfortunately, Scotland couldn't take their chances. Consequently, uh, the, uh, losing the first goal, which is always important in those type of games. So um, it's going to be a difficult game for England. I honestly believe the first goal again is going to be important. But the difference now is England don't need to win the game. England can be quite happy with a draw, where Scotland need to get something out of this game. If they don't win this game, Scotland, it's going to be virtually impossible to get out of the group. So for that in itself, tactically, it's going to be very important that. England use the game properly and use it and understand maybe play on the break as a as a tactic, and um, obviously Scotland have to have to make more chances and maybe go go for it particularly in the latter stage of the game. But it's going to be a fascinating game, and I'm really looking forward to watching it. Is that a England Scotland confrontation? Is it a bit like a, a Rangers Celtic one in the <laughs> sense that even if one side should be dominant as England should be tomorrow and on all known form. It doesn't quite work out like that because of the ancient rivalry, because it's very much a, a, a derby atmosphere plus. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. Yeah, I totally agree. It's, it is a derby, if you like. I mean, most of the players in Scotland know most of the players in England team and vice versa. So in that in itself is going to be different to most international games. But the fact that there's going to be a crowd there as well, that should add a bit of spice to the game. I mean, obviously, the English... Crowd haven't had many games to watch, never mind uh, over the last few months. So, although I don't think there'll be a full house, it will seem like a full house because uh, the England supporters will be right behind the team. And being such a young, young England squad, it's going to be interesting how England deal with it. But obviously, being at home, that should give England the uh, the advantage, I think. When you played for Rangers, it was almost a a unique situation because the English clubs were excluded from Europe. You yeah. and uh, a number of other very prominent English internationalists decided to, to play for Rangers, probably to get European football, uh, as one of your reasons. Uh, uh, that, so you must have had you know, virtually an England team dressing room at Ibrox back then. Is that true? <laughs> yeah, we did have quite a few English lads playing in the, um, in the team. Actually, it's funny because we used to, on a Friday especially, we used to have an England versus Scotland team. Or oh, in the end, because we had so many foreigners full stop, we used to, used to just have an international team versus Scotland team at five aside. So we used to have a lot of fun with that. And uh, it was great. It was a great time to be at Glasgow Rangers. We had a great time. And uh, a lot of us lived in an area called Boswell uh, near Hamilton, I believe. So, yeah, it was great to be part of the club. And uh, the English lads definitely uh, took the mickey, as it were, when uh, the games were going on. Wasn't that a, a bit dangerous having training games England against Scotland? Were, were the tackles not a bit robust for training tackles under these circumstances? <laughs> there was, and um, and that's how the manager wanted it. Frankly, I don't think he, he ever wanted a training session which wasn't fired up anyway. Uh, and Graham Souness, who was the manager at the time, he, he invariably was in the thick of things, smashing people as well. So that's how we played. We trained as we played, basically. So yes, it was it was interesting. You have to keep your wits about you, definitely. Uh, I, I want to uh, ask you about uh, two more things, Mark. Uh, firstly, just what are the prospects of these two teams tomorrow? I mean, I mean England, uh, uh, according to uh, Harry Kane, are, are better than they were in the World Cup. I mean, are they on the, the verge of greatness, this uh, England side? What do you think? Well, I hope so. It's been a long time since uh, England have uh, won anything, as you know. Um, there seems to be a better camaraderie in the team than there were the last time. Uh, but for me, it's all the luck of the draw. If you can avoid the big hitters in the, in the, in the competition, the Frances, the Germanys, and even Portugal, the oldest at the moment, then um, it, can, it can be a good tournament for England. But it, it won't be easy, and people like Harry Kane have to stay fit. He's generally England, England's talisman, and he scores most of the goals. So I, I agree, in a way, camaraderie-wise, it definitely seems to be in a better place. But only time will tell with the results. I mean, obviously, great start to the competition. You need to win your first game, uh, in my opinion, if you're really going to uh, progress. Uh, England have done that. So the pressure's off a little bit, but obviously things can change quickly. Need to beat Scotland on Friday, and then um, things can be a little bit easier. And finally, Mark Walters, your boot winging it and uh, your, your coaching of uh, youngs. What message would you have to, to young girls and boys uh, 
particularly young black girls and boys looking for a, a future in the game. But what would what would be your message as a, an established star in terms of uh, how they should conduct themselves looking forward? Oh, that, that, it's um, it's a wonderful wonderful game to get involved in. It's a vehicle to cross all kinds of barriers. It's uh, it open uh, life for me. Um, I would you know it was the best part of my young life was was playing football. You know to get paid to do something. It was an absolute dream. But even if you're not getting paid, just which I, I did didn't at the end of my career, I can assure you, just playing and running around was fantastic. And I I would definitely definitely advise anybody not only to get into football but any sport because that is a great way to not only open your life to things but to to meet other people and to uh, to make sure that you you know enjoy your life because I, I think it did that for me without a doubt. Mark Walters of Aston Villa, Liverpool, England and Glasgow Rangers, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for having me, thank you. Any England-Scotland match is about more than sport and an England-Scotland football showdown is about much more. Alex assesses the prospects and the politics with top Scots pundit Jim Spence. Well, Jim Spence, let's take a look at the oldest international fixture in association football, Scotland v England. Now, way back when it started, Scotland were the totally dominant side. And we've just been hearing about the, the marvellous March 1881, uh, when Andrew Watson led his team to a 6-1 drubbing of England at the Oval. Were you covering that game, Jim? I, 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 the train was late that day, Alex, so I missed it. Uh... <laughs> but you know, you're, you're absolutely right. We, we we were the dominant force very much. There, there have been periods where we have been the dominant force, probably three in total. But um, the, the game that you're talking about is indicative of when we were the the power in the land. I know that you've spoken to um, Jed O'Brien, who's currently writing uh, the Scottish game, uh, how Scotland invented modern world football. I know he's doing that for for telly and and in book form. He talks extensively about the. You know, Andrew Watson, the first black player that uh, you know to play for Scotland. It only took another 120 years for the next one, Nigel Quasi, to come along. But um, we were very much, you know, we we were the power uh, in the land. We were the power in world football. We invented the game. I think you know, Jed will tell you this. We invented the game. Our, our English brethren kind of hung on to our coattails. I think it's fair to say. And of course, Watson, as you will know, played an integral part in that when he eventually went from Queens Park, who are the the doyens of world football uh, down to uh, to English game and took uh, took the game with them. The, the Scotch professors uh, approach, as it came to be known. So we were very much the dominant force in the game. We invented we invented the world game of football. In the sixties and the seventies was a remarkable flow of talent into the the, the Scottish international side. I mean, the sixties, uh, uh, Jim Baxter, Dennis Law, Dave Mackay. Uh, and the seventh is great players as well. Uh, but despite the fact that we probably were among the best teams in the world, whereas England famously won the World Cup in 1966, or so they claim. Uh, but uh, the Scottish team, <laughs> the Scottish <laughs> team, never seemed to. They made it to the finals in the 70s, but they never, they never progressed. How can you explain having a, a, an overflow of talent and not actually you know, reaching the, the final stages of tournaments? Well, you know, I, I've often posited a kind of a general thought on this. that You, you, know, the, you know what we were like, the Scots, in the 50s and the 60s, even into the 70s? We, you know, we liked a wee swally. We were a bit kind of... Jack the lad, we were a bit intemperate, we, we didn't like being told what to do. And I think that very often rubbed off on the football team because, they, you know, as we, Jim McLean up here in Dundee, used to say, make no mistake, we had world class players. Baxter, Law, Mackay, guys like Jimmy Johnson sometimes didn't get in the team. You know, we had world class players in, in that period. They would have fitted into any team anywhere because we undoubtedly did not uh, do nearly as well as we should have done, given the level of talent that we had. We had players who quite easily could have played for any team in the world. We knew that when England won the World Cup, um, albeit with a dodgy half-over-the-line uh, ball, there is no doubt that when we beat them 3-2, that people like Baxter and Law and these kind of players um, were, were you know, as good and better than anything that they had. But very often, I think, we were an ill-disciplined law. And, and, and that 
negated the great talent, and it truly was great talent that we had. Now let's bring it back, right back to the present moment. We're on the eve of the, the big match, Jim. The, the sap is, is rising, to say the least. Are we on the cusp of a, a golden generation of young Scottish players, and could they upset the overwhelming favourites tomorrow? Well, well I, I hope so, Alex. I mean, we, we have two... You know, we, have, we find ourselves in the bizarre situation of having two world-class left-backs in, in Tierney and Robertson. You know, I mean, I mean, I'm sitting here speaking to you from Dundee. Andy Robertson, of course, started at Queen's Park, having been, been released as a youth by Celtic. I bet they're regretting that one now. Um, and, and, you know, coming to Dundee United, making a wonderful success of it, going down to Hull, and then, of course, to, to Liverpool. A magnificent football player. And Kieran Tierney, who set the head of the light, at Arsenal, fantastic players, and the emergence of young Billy Gilmore, you know, the, the, the ex-Rangers kid who went to Chelsea. Uh, now, th these are immensely talented football players. They're comfortable on the ball, they're at ease, they've got pace, they've got talent, they've got trickery. Um, so I, I think that they're, they're, there's huge light at the end of what has been a long, dark tunnel. I think we are on the cusp, potentially, of something pretty big in Scotland. But, you know, we, we, we've got our act together, I think, throughout the game in terms of coaching, in terms of modern methods and all the rest of it. And I think very much that we, you know, we've got great potential here. And the three that I've just mentioned, to me, will we, we'll stand the test of time. They're as good as anything anywhere. And if you stick a successful football side together with political initiative, does that make Scotland unstoppable, Jim Spence? Well, uh, let's hope so, Alex. Let's hope so. I mean, it, it would be it would be quite something, wouldn't it, to uh, go to su a successful conclusion to the European Championships and then march on to independence shortly thereafter. Right, Jim Spence. Thank you so much for for joining us from Dundee, and thank you for for being with us on the Alex Salmon Show. Thank you, Alex. Football is not a matter of life and death. It's more important than that. So said the legendary Liverpool manager and socialist Scot, Bill Shankly. For generations of Scots, the hope rather than the reality of beating England at Wembley was more important than anything else. More important than life, than work and certainly than politics. It was a very embodiment of nationhood. But where stands Scotland now? The nation has its own parliament, its own political culture and its own dynamic. Has Scotland outgrown these Wembley confrontations? Has football now been placed in its proper perspective? Probably yes. Hey, but maybe ask me that question again tomorrow. So from Wembley and from Alex and myself on All at the Show, it's goodbye, stay safe, and we'll see you all again next week.